Welcome back, everyone. In chapter four, we'll get our first introduction to probability. So let's review the learning outcomes for this chapter. In this video, we'll cover the first learning outcome of the chapter, and we're going to go over the basic concepts related to probability. We're also going to discuss the three approaches to assessing probability. Then in the next two videos, we will learn about the different rules of probability, including the addition and multiplication rules. And then we're going to wrap it up with Bayes' theorem involving conditional probabilities. So let's get started. So finding the probability of something is to find the chance that a particular event will occur. A probability value will be between the range of 0 to 1. So on the left side here, 0 means it's impossible. So that could be something like living forever. And then 1 is for certain. So that could be something like the sun will rise again. Now, in between 0 and 1, we have unlikely probabilities, such as winning the lottery, and then even probability, like heads or tails, which is a 50-50 chance. And then finally, becoming a good student is considered a likely if you put in the effort, follow all the tips I provide in this course, and you come to class. Now, you learned in Chapter 1 about an experiment. So this is where we go through a process to find the single outcome that cannot be predicted with certainty, such as flipping a coin. In the next few slides, we're going to talk about the sample space and the different types of events. So in terms of probability, a sample space is a collection of all the possible outcomes that can result from a selection, decision, or experiment. So for instance, on the left here, we have some examples of different experiments. So I could toss a coin. I can inspect a part, say a phone, for instance. I can conduct a sales call to try to sell you something or I can roll a six-sided die. So the sample space for these experiments are the outcomes. So tossing a coin can either result in a heads or tails. Inspecting a part can result in a defective or non-defective part. When I make that sales call, the person can either purchase or not make a purchase. And then rolling a six-sided die, the outcomes that might come up are one, two, three, four, five, or six. So the sample space is all the potential outcomes of an experiment that we might run. So let's look at an example from the textbook. So problem 4.3 says if two customers are asked to list their choice of ice cream flavors out of vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry, list the sample space of the possible outcomes. So our experiment here is to find out the customer's choice of flavor. And the item of interest is the ice cream flavor. The possible outcomes for one trial or one customer here, are three flavors, V for vanilla, C for chocolate, and S for strawberry. So in step three, we need to define the sample space. So for one customer, the sample space is V, C, S for each flavor. Since we're interested in finding the sample space for two customers, we must expand our outcomes. So a table can be a useful way to organize the possible outcomes. Outcome one is where our first customer says vanilla and our second customer also says vanilla. Our next outcome is our first customer continues to say vanilla and then the second customer says chocolate. So you can see we changed the possible outcomes or the combination of outcomes for our two customers. For a sample space of two customers, we could start with each flavor and list out each of the flavors for customer two and then you repeat this until you have every possible outcome. So here, we could write out our sample space. We're gonna write the acronyms for the flavors. We can see here that there are nine possible outcomes. Each one of these letters represents one of the flavors for our first and second customer. Now, another way to find the sample space is to draw a tree diagram. This is a great way to visualize the process that I just described. So in the top branch of the tree, we start with customer one and the flavor choice of vanilla. We have three total flavors, so you just connect the three lines for each of the flavor choices, and this gets us three possible outcomes in the first branch. We repeat this exercise for customer one's choice of chocolate, and then we do it for strawberry, and then we have fully built out our tree diagram showing the nine possible outcomes in the sample space. This is just another visual way of drawing the outcomes as opposed to doing it systematically in the table. Now, another term that you're going to be hearing throughout the semester is the idea of an event of interest. 
So an event of interest is a collection of experimental outcomes. This is something that we're interested in studying. We discussed the first three steps of the experiment. So now step four is to define the event of interest. So going back to the ice cream example, we might be interested in knowing when at least one customer chooses vanilla. So it's important that we understand what at least one means. So another way of saying that would be one or more customer chooses vanilla. So here is the same table again that we created for our sample space of the flavor choices between two customers. We want to look through all of the outcomes to find when at least one customer chose vanilla. We can see here five outcomes where vanilla was one of the choices. So when we write out the event of interest, we'll denote the big E here and write little e, one, two, three, four, and seven. So we are numbering our possible outcomes here, and that will represent the combination where it satisfies our event of interest. So we can see here that there are five outcomes. It's important to understand the types of events that we'll be dealing with. The first is the mutually exclusive events. This is the occurrence where one event cannot happen at the same time as another, meaning there's no common outcomes and there's no overlap. So for a business example, if you have an oil rig and we're drilling for oil, event A is that we strike oil. So this image is showing oil coming out of the rig. So the other event is that we dig and turns out there's no oil in this oil rig. You can't have it happen at the same time. You either have oil or you don't. Another type of event to be aware of is independent events. This is when one event in no way influences the occurrence of another event. So here's another business example and assume we have a fashion salon in Chicago. The event, whether the salon will be successful, has no influence on a men's fashion store, let's say, in San Francisco. These are two completely independent events in terms of whether they will be successful in their business. The next type of event to be aware of is dependent events. So this is where the occurrence of one event impacts the chance of something else happening. So for instance, here's our business example where we have a small company that has three males and seven female employees. So two are gonna be randomly chosen to attend a conference. Now let's say the first person that gets chosen randomly is this female. Then when we try to figure out the chances of our next person being male, what we have to do is we have to remove that first person that got chosen. That now changes the chance of who gets picked for the second slot to attend the conference. So let's say this gentleman gets chosen. So the probability for the second person being male to get chosen will change after we pick the first person. Let's do a quick concept check in terms of the different types of events that we just discussed. Now, when we look at the first scenario, it says you can either be in class or you can be at home sleeping. Would this be considered an independent, mutually exclusive or dependent event? So if you said mutually exclusive, you're right because you can't be in two places at the same time. You can not be at home and at work at the same time, so they are mutually exclusive. So looking at the second example, let's say you pay for coffee with a credit card and then the person behind you in the line also pays with a credit card. Are these two events independent of each other or dependent on each other? When you're in line paying for something, you don't normally know the person behind you. So this would be considered an independent event because the person behind you is most likely a stranger and doesn't know you and has nothing to do with whether you use a credit card. So in the last scenario, you're driving 30 miles over the speed limit and you get a speeding ticket. What type of event would this fall under? Well, we only have one option left, but if you said dependent, you are right. Let's now talk about the three different methods for assigning probability, which are classical, relative, and subjective. Now, when you see the symbol P of E, this is big P for probability, and then capital E to the I is our event of interest occurring. So with classical probability assessment, this is based on the ratio of the number of ways an outcome or event can occur. It assumes that the number of ways an outcome or event can occur for each individual outcome are equally likely. So think about that six-sided die. When I roll the die, all six sides are equally likely to happen. So that's an example of classical probability. The way we calculate it is we find the number of ways our event of interest can occur, and then we divide it by the total number of possible outcomes. Let's go ahead and review a couple of examples. So company A has 10 employees, seven are female, three are male. 
We're going to assess the probability of a female employee being selected at random to travel to a convention. So the event is female. So there are seven females. And then we're going to divide by the total number of possible outcomes. So that is 10. So we're going to take 7 divided by 10 and we get 0 0.70. So there's a 70% chance a female is selected, assuming all employees have the same chance of being selected. Let's go ahead and look at example B now. Let's say a new car dealer has five GM cars, six Ford, three Toyota, eight Nissans, and two BMW cars. So if one car is selected to be placed on sale, what's the probability that it's a Nissan? So now again, we assume classical probability. So that means all of the cars have an equal chance of occurring. So the event of interest here is Nissan. So we have eight Nissans and we divide by the total number of possible outcomes. So we got to add up all of the cars and we get 24. So we take eight divided by 24 and we get 0.33. So the probability of getting a Nissan is 33%. So for relative frequency probability, this should sound familiar as we covered it back in chapter two. This is based on the probability that the number of times an event occurs is divided by the total number of times an experiment is performed. So E to the I represents the event of interest and big N represents the number of trials. So let's go ahead and walk through a practice problem. So here's problem 4.8 from the textbook. A census of 2,500 employees of a company with a 401k retirement account identified the number of males and females by their respective account balance. We have four balance ranges. The first one is less than 25,000. The second one is 25,000 to $49,999. The third one is 50,000 to $99,999. And then the last one is greater than or equal to $100,000. So for the first part, what is the probability that a randomly selected employee will be female? So here's our formula that shows the probability of the event is the number of times the event occurs over the total number of trials. So our event of interest is that a female is selected. The number of trials is the 2,500 employees in the census. So we need to add up the number of females for each of the balance buckets. So we take the 495 plus 210 plus 260 plus 45, and we get 1,010. So we're going to go ahead and divide 1,010 by 2,500. And so the probability of selecting a female is 0 0.4040. Now we want to know what the probability that a randomly selected employee will have a balance between $25,000 and $49,999. So our event of interest here is the employee had a balance between 25,000 and 49,999. Our number of trials remains the 2,500 employees. And then this time we wanna add up the number of males and females that had a balance in this range. So we're gonna take the 185 plus 210 and we get 395. And we're gonna divide the 395 by the 2,500 employees. And so the probability of selecting an employee with a balance between 25,000 and 49,999 is 0.1580. So for our third scenario here, we want to know if a randomly selected employee is female and has a balance between 50,000 and 99,999. So our event of interest is female with a balance between 50,000 and 99,999. The number of trials remains the 2,500 employees. And now we're interested in the females with this balance, which is 260 from the table. And then we're gonna divide by the 2,500. So the probability of selecting a female with a balance between 50,000 and 99,999 is 0.1040. So the last type of probability assessment is called subjective probability assessment. This is based on the decision maker's state of mind. So in other words, their opinion or their expertise. So let's consider an example. Let's say a target manager is asked to assess the chances that a shipment from a new supplier will arrive on time. So now using subjective probability, this manager might assess the probability at 0.75 being on time. So you might be asking yourself, well, where did that number come from? 
And so this is where she's going to use her experience and her expertise to make this probability assessment. So for instance, she might be using her experiences with past suppliers or her knowledge about the current supplier and their reputation out in the market. So subjective probability is just that, it's subjective. This method might be more difficult to justify, but sometimes if the data is not available, we need to rely on our experts to make these estimates. Well, everyone, that wraps up this first video covering the basics of probability. In the next video, we'll talk about all the different rules of probability.